Good evening. If you do have a mobile phone, if you'd like to put it on silent, please, thank you. Right, huge welcome back to Clive De Carl. Anyone who has watched the UK column over the past couple of years will probably have seen his interviews with health experts. Tonight, Clive takes the guesswork out of why you were ill, focusing on minerals and how many people are deficient in them and the consequences of having that status. Also up for discussion is heavy metal and chemical poisoning with methods to safely remove the toxic load. Clive also has a special machine that can help to determine mineral levels non-invasively. Please welcome Clive Decal. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like to tell you uh, as much as I can about minerals and how important they are. But before I start on them, I want to tell you about amino acids. I had a very extraordinary client come and see me in the summer last year, and he got out of the car, and he must have been about 50, and he looked so ill, he could barely get out of the car, barely walk, and he came in, the first thing he said to me was, I haven't eaten food for 20 years. And I said, how is that possible? You haven't eaten food for 20 years? He said, yeah, yeah, four and a half bottles of sweet white wine um, gives me all the calories I need. Uh, and he said, but actually now, after 20 years of doing that, I realized that I do have to start eating again. See, he looked like he was going to die. I mean, he really looked in a really bad way. Anyway, so I explained to him about minerals and how you need minerals to, to be strong and healthy. Because, I mean, minerals, obviously, as you know, are the basis of everything. You know, this desk, everything is made of, of minerals. So if you're low on one mineral, that can be a really, really serious issue for your health. It can have dramatic effects. Anyway, this guy was low on everything because he, he wasn't eating. So I suggested to him that eating food might be a really sensible move. And I gave him some supplements. And the, the most important supplement that I stressed for him were amino acids. And I gave him eight bottles of amino acids. That, that was eight months' supply. And I told him to take a bottle a day. All right, don't try this at home. Don't do it without proper advice. Anyway, he rings me up two days later, and he says, uh, yesterday, he said, no, sorry, the evening after he'd seen me, he came home, poured himself a glass of white wine as normal, and he said he just didn't feel like it, because I'd already given him two, th he'd already had two-thirds of a bottle at that point. And um, so he said that the following day, he'd eaten five meals. Now, personally, I thought this was really stupid to eat five meals when you haven't eaten anything for 20 years. And I, I was worried that he might have, you know, issues, but actually he was fine with the five meals. And um, anyway, after eight days, he runs out of amino acids. And he's totally cleared me out of stock. I, I hadn't reordered them at that point. And um, he goes back on the booze again. Get him some more amino acids, comes off the booze, runs out. And this continues a few times until he realizes he needs the amino acids. Anyway, he's now reduced the dose substantially. He just had to have that heavy dose to start with. And I saw him actually about two weeks ago, and he's still off the booze. Uh, that's you know, nine, ten months later, uh, with no problem. So I started getting very interested in amino acids and, and what, what they could do for people. So I started saying, well, if, if you can give a whole bottle a day of amino acids and have that sort of effect of getting people off booze, what if you did it intravenously? So I started researching intravenous amino acids, and it turns out there are addiction clinics around the world offering amino acid therapy by IV. Now, 30% of us, something like that, has the addictive brain. In other words, we're born with low dopamine levels. We don't have the dopamine levels that the other people have. And if you are one of those people, the first time you get access to a dopamine stimulator, uh, you're going to think, wow, why is this the first time I've tried this? So for, for a lot of children, it's maybe the first time they tried alcohol. They had a beer for the first time, and suddenly they feel great. Or they have a joint for the first time. Or whatever the dopamine kick is for somebody, it might be heroin, it might be cocaine, it might be sex, it might be gambling, it might be internet porn, it might be uh, telephones, it might be staring at the mobile phone and checking it, it, it you know, doing what people do on an addictive basis. So the weird thing is that it turns out that for many people, if they have 10 intravenous amino acid injections in a row over a period of 10 days or so, 
it appears that they can permanently reset their dopamine levels to normal. Um, now, I'm in the process of studying this right now, but if any of you uh, know somebody or, or have an addiction problem, I recommend you start looking at amino acids for addiction. Um, I was blessed or unblessed by being given two addicts last year who presented themselves to me, and they were on crack and heroin and were in a terrible state. You know, open sores all over their bodies, weeping pus and blood, and they were, in, you know, young. And um, I made the mistake of thinking I could help them. Big mistake on my part. I wasted a lot of time, but I learned a lot. Um, I took them to a clinic that had a machine called an e-libra, which is a bioresonance device. And every so sat them down. They connected to the bioresonance device for two hours. <laughs> And afterwards, I'd ask them, how are the cravings for crack and heroin now? And every time they went on this device, they said, I haven't got any. Gone. Okay? You could turn off their addiction with the eLibra bioresonance machine. But the nature of their addiction was so, so strong and so powerful that even though they weren't craving it, they went back and did it again anyway. And eventually, Lambeth Council took their children away, and it all ended uh, rather, rather badly. Um, However, it's important that you know that addictions can be overcome and it's not necessarily that difficult. Let, let's talk about addictions from another perspective. Now, this is a, a mineral test um, which is not untypical and obviously the one that stands out there is chromium. This person is incredibly low on chromium and the reference level, which is here, the, the correct reference level is 0.82. Now, this person is 0.29. So, you know, if the chart went further that way, they'd probably be right off to the left. So I can tell you with incredible confidence that this person is going to be craving carbohydrates and sweet stuff and possibly chocolate as if their life depended on it. This person, with that low level of chromium, will not be able to have self-control when it comes to binge eating. Right? They're not going to be able to do it because they're, on a subconscious level, their body is saying, you are so low on chromium, you have to find it somehow. And uh, so most people will try and look for it in sugar, in carbohydrate, particularly bread products. So how many of you are wheat addicts? So an addict, well done, uh, uh, we, you know, an addict is somebody who does the same thing repetitively, perhaps many times a day. So the wheat addict is like you get up in the morning craving uh, toast, croissants, pastry, patisserie, uh, cereal, whatever it is that the wheat, wheat addict wants. And then mid morning, halfway through the morning, they're probably going to have a biscuit, a bit more wheat. And at lunchtime, they're probably going to have a sandwich or pasta pizza, pies, whatever it is, and then in the afternoon they'll probably have some cake or some biscuits, more, more wheat, then they maybe come home and have a few beers and some pasta for lunch and so on. And so a lot of people are complete wheat addicts and not realizing it. You know, being a wheat addict in, when I was young was not a problem. You know, I was brought up uh, with my grandparents who used to eat bread all the time. It was just normal. It was white bread and it had anchor butter and jam on it usually. And they were all right. Nobody, when I was young, had a gluten intolerant problem that I was aware of. Nobody had problems with wheat. Now, probably maybe 50% of people do. And of course, as probably most of you know, the reason for that isn't that we've changed, but they've changed the wheat. When I was young, it was this high. Now it's just above your ankles. Now they spray it, if it's not organic, before harvest with the glyphosate herbicide, because wheat, like all plants, tends to r ripen unevenly. So in the old days, they'd cut the wheat, and some of it was right, but some of it wasn't. But they've now discovered that if they spray glyphosate on it eight days or so before harvest, it all dies at once. And as it dies, you know, a dying plant will put all its energy into making the seed big and, and healthy for survival. So they kill the plant, flooding it with toxic chemicals, which then go into the wheat which we eat. And so a lot of the reasons why people are having problems with wheat is, is 
from the herbicides, but there are other reasons as well. Just simply the hybridization over the years of changing that wheat uh, to, grow, to be much smaller um, has made it pretty much inedible. And most of the, a lot of the plants that we're eating, let's say you think, well, I'm being really healthy, I'm eating a lovely vegetarian diet, and I'm eating broccoli and all this healthy stuff. Well, broccoli 100 years ago didn't look anything like the big things of broccoli that we get now. You know, broccoli used to be spindly, just like wheat used to be all over the place height-wise. And in this endeavor to standardize fruits and vegetables, they've destroyed them. You know, ha when I was young, everything had seeds. You know, cucumber had big viable seeds that you could dry and plant the next year. Now they've bred seeds out of almost every plant. So we're, eat we're being fed seedless food. It's so weak, so unnatural, it can't even reproduce itself. And we're supposed to think that we're getting full nutrition from it. So this picture here is not untypical of the average person. You know, um, excess of calcium, not enough magnesium. So why would that be? Well, stress depletes magnesium. And I would say all of us are stressed and all of us, probably without exception in this room, including myself, unless you do something about it, are going to be low on magnesium. So I've been recommending magnesium to people for, for a decade or more, and I thought I was taking enough personally, and I thought that I was advising people to take enough. Turns out I wasn't. Turns out that I wasn't advising people to take nearly enough. And almost everybody I'm te I've tested has been low on magnesium. It's been surprising, and magnesium is number one mineral number one. Without magnesium you're going to have serious problems. You're not going to be able to utilize vitamin C properly. You're not going to be, you're not, you're not going to be able to have a properly functioning body making all the enzymes to digest the food and so on. Magnesium deficiency is rife. I, I would suggest that it's almost everybody in the UK. Almost everybody. And remember that you know, 100 or so years ago less than 1% of the population had heart attacks all the diseases that we think of now as being rife, you know, fibromyalgia, those words hadn't been thought of yet. I mean, fibromyalgia is basically mul multiple muscle pain. And the doctor will tell you, oh, you've got fibromyalgia, like it's some disease you've caught, you know, like a virus. But most of the problems that we face today are self-inflicted. I would suggest that 80% maybe of the, the toxic poisoning that most of us are getting is actually from the foods that we're choosing to eat and is organic enough well I was an organic farmer for nine years I had an organic farm in Spain now you, you all know the answer to this over the nine years how many times did they come to check how how organic I was you can guess the answer it was zero times in nine years I mean so can you trust organic from China yeah, if from Spain they didn't come and test me in nine years, what are they doing elsewhere? So, um, what's better than organic? Well, biodynamic. Biodynamic is farming like it used to be, where it's to the phases of the moon. And you know, all our ancestors, doesn't matter where in the world we come from, all our ancestors used to garden using the phases of the moon, using the old methods that have been passed down traditionally for since forever. And now all that old knowledge is essentially lost. So everybody's picture is look, looks like this. So even though the magnesium is in the green, it should be right down the middle in OK. You know, so just because it says it's in normal, well, what I've noticed is that most normal people are ill.